I'm excited to introduce our speaker today. Casey has always been fascinated with the science of the human body and healing since being a child. She began her journey into healthy eating in the year 2000. Growing up with a mother who had MS, she researched for years to learn about the effects of food on our health, generic predispositions, and how to offset them with natural preventive measures. This path eventually led her to eat a mostly plant-based diet for the last 20 years. Casey worked at a natural healing institute for cancer and other diseases, teaching raw and living food classes in addition to coaching weight loss clients. Casey has been with Cheap RV Living since April 2018 as the assistant to Bob Wells. She loves living on the road and currently resides in a subcompact car with a small 12 volt fridge for all her fresh foods. She will share some tips on eating as healthy as possible while living the nomad lifestyle. She hopes to inspire you and that you eat healthy no matter what you are living in. Please welcome Casey. Thank you very much, Alicia, for that welcome, that wonderful introduction. And thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited to be here and thank you all for attending. This is my passion, so I hope it will be uh, very helpful for you. So just a little bit um, more about that introduction. I grew up eating cereal and soda and white bread and we used to purchase cases of soda in my family. We'd stack them up in the laundry room. So uh, when I was a child, as Alicia mentioned, my mom got sick and I began to wonder, uh, was it possible that it could be genetic, um, possibly genetic, and could I possibly have a genetic predisposition to this? So, you know, I was pretty concerned. So I did a lot of my own personal research, which led me on a huge journey of the science of how food affects our health. And in the year 2000, I stopped eating the standard American diet and I ended up losing about 25 pounds or so. And I stopped getting severe acne. I used to have real severe acne and I stopped getting colds and I used to have very bad throat infections that I would take penicillin for every year. Anyway, all of that stopped um, when I changed my diet and I was living in Alaska at the time. And I did change at that time to vegan and raw foods, but there were a lot of mistakes that I made along the way. And so I learned a lot about what worked and what didn't work. And eventually it did lead me to teaching classes at a healing center for cancer. And, but really what I want this class to be about is the first steps in your own journey and taking a look at the basic building blocks of creating your own definition of a healthy diet and how to do it successfully on the road. And so I need to point out that Although I no longer cook on the road, and for those of you who are hoping that this might be a healthy cooking class, <laughs> I'm sorry to disappoint you, it won't be that, but we will address that in another class in the future, so stay tuned for um, classes on healthy cooking in the future on the road. So let's dive in. The first thing that I wanna share with you is what I call the golden rule. And the one thing that remains true is that it's really good to focus on a whole foods diet, no matter what you're eating. If you eat single ingredient, mostly unprocessed, nutrient dense foods, 90 to 95% of the time, you will be healthy, shed unwanted body fat, and you'll have a lot more energy. There's no one size fits all, I think, when it comes to eating because bio individuality plays a huge role. But whether you're vegan or vegetarian, carnivore, omnivore, pescatarian, no matter what you follow, I think we can all agree that eating a whole unprocessed food uh, diet is quite healthy. It's really the original human diet and it's how we evolved to eat. So that's why labels when it comes to diets, they're really not good because you can take any diet label and you can make it healthy or unhealthy. For example, if you eat keto, 
uh, with whole foods, all whole foods, you know, you could eat it quite health healthily. But if you eat keto with all processed keto bars and processed foods, it would be unhealthy. And the same thing with being a vegan, uh, which is why I don't like to label myself, um, because I you can either do vegan as a whole plant foods based diet and be very healthy, or you can eat vegan and eat mostly processed foods like breads, tons of grains, tofu, fake meat, and lots of soy products. So, you know, this really isn't about label, labeling because no matter what diet you follow, following a whole foods-based approach should be your number one priority. And it will activate the satiety hormones and it will help to st stabilize your blood sugar. And it will also help to moderate insulin and cortisol. And so I like to follow like a 90-10 rule. So 90% of the time eating whole foods and 10% of the time allowing yourself to eat what you're craving. It's time that you can allocate for gatherings or celebrations where you don't have to feel bad. Um, like if you eat a slice of pizza or cake or, you know, whatever is your treat. And so in that way, you, you don't feel like you're depriving yourself. So that brings us to the question, which whole foods are best for you and why are they important? And if you can bear with me for about eight or nine minutes, I'd like to give you a little background on the science behind this before speaking about how it specifically applies to being a nomad. So um, first of all, the number one reason that I got into living foods or whole foods and, and the raw food diet is for enzymes. If you're eating unprocessed, uncooked, raw living plant foods, you're getting a lot of enzymes. We have two types of enzymes in our body. You have digestive enzymes and you have metabolic enzymes. Over the course of your lifetime, eating cooked foods for your whole entire life, your amount of digestive enzymes is less than when you were like a child. So what your body does is, is it will steal digestive enzymes and um, turn them into metabolic enzymes, like for your immune system. And so by eating raw um, plant food, you're actually gaining a lot of those enzymes that you need for your digestive um, digestive to replenish your digestive enzymes. So an enzyme deficiency with cooked foods where enzy enzymes are destroyed, it actually causes your red blood cells to stick together and then they can't travel through the smaller veins as easily and it causes the body to have lower oxygen levels. And in those areas of your body where you have lower oxygen le levels, you become more susceptible to cancer. And I can explain that a little further by explaining alkalinity very briefly. You might have heard like uh, people that want to be alkaline or maintain an alkaline diet. And that's because our blood should be 7.365 blood alkalinity. An acid and alkaline scale starts, um, well, it as you progress higher, it's more alkaline. As you progress lower, it's more acidic. So really the only things that we eat that are alkaline is the stem of the plant and the leaf of the plant. That's really it. Um, the body is more, the more alkaline you are, the less likely you would get cancer because when you're more alkaline, your body is more oxygenated. Now, most foods are acidic. Soda is extremely acidic, very, very low on the acid scale, like 2.5. Coffee is very acidic. Meat, grains, they're all acidic. So the only thing that's really alkaline are like salads, green smoothies, green juices. So there's, you know, there's those, those two things because all enzymes and alkalinity very important because all illness in the body lives and proliferates in an acidic state because that means there's lower oxygen in your blood cancer actually has a ph of 6.0 so that brings me to the last part in my little science talk which is otto warburg and otto warburg studied cell respiration He's a two-time Nobel Prize winner, and he has a book called The Metabolism of Tumors. And he would have gotten the Nobel Prize three times. However, he was a Jew in Nazi Germany, and so the 
uh, German government did not allow him to accept it the third time. But what he said was the primary cause of cancer is the replacement of oxygen in the respiratory cell chemistry by the fermentation of sugar. And what that means in plain terms is the more like sugar is very acidic. In fact, that's what they inject into you when they're looking for cancer, they inject sugar into the body. So what he did was he took these Petri dishes and he added the element of oxygen and he was literally turning on or off the growth of cancer cells that were initiated by fermentation. And that uh, process was triggered by the absence of oxygen at the cellular level. So um, cancer maintains, like I said, a, uh, a pH of 6.0 due to lactic acid. So when we are eating living plant foods and they are creating oxygen from photosynthesis, we're literally taking that oxygen into your body. And we really are what we eat. I can't stress that enough. You're actually creating your blood with every bite of food you take. And that is because your food goes through your small intestine and it's absorbed through the intestinal alveoli into the bloodstream. So the muscles of the small intestine mix that food that you're eating with your digestive juices from the pancreas and the liver and the intestine. And it pushes that mist mixture forward for digestion through the walls of the small intestine where it's then absorbed into your bloodstream. So literally you are what you eat. And of course, your blood goes through every organ in your body, including your brain. So it's very, very important that what we eat is what we want in our blood. And, um, you know, for example, alcohol can pass through the blood brain barrier. So you're literally poisoning your brain when you drink alcohol. So that's the end of my science lecture. You made it through. <laughs> and now how do you actually start, right? Let's get to the nuts and bolts. So if you make your plate uh, half raw every day, and when I say raw, I'm really referring to plant food, not meat um, in, in this case. So you want to add this juice or add that smoothie to your breakfast. And it's not about deprivation, it's just about adding healthier choices. So adding juices and smoothies and salads are very alkalizing and they add enzymes and they add that oxygen that we just talked about. So think of it as adding and not taking away. And also it's important to add probiotic foods which help promote promote good gut bacteria. And I, I feel personally that this is incredibly overlooked and very, very important. So uh, for example, um, when I go to farmer's markets, there's someone who sells kimchi and kimchi is like a natural Asian kind of a spicy sauerkraut or sauerkraut or coconut yogurt. I always have those items in my fridge um, because they're full of uh, probiotics and you want to have a a really good amount of natural gut bacteria. And you can also take probiotics. But getting back to how to really start, you also wanna add more cruciferous vegetables. Those are vegetables that are high in vitamins and minerals, such as folate and vitamin K. So they're dark green uh, vegetables that are excellent sources of vitamin A and vitamin C. They're also rich in phytonutrients and plant-based compounds that help to lower inflammation in your body and reduce the risk of developing cancer. So another huge thing, it's really all about what you leave out. And I might say that a few times during this, it's more about what you leave out than what you put in. If you could stop just even, uh, or like experiment with um, leaving sugar out, white sugar, um, stop drinking soda, or eating foods that are insulogenic. Um, when I say insulinogenic, what I mean are foods that spike your blood sugar, because that in turn will cause you to store fat. And it can also cause a fatty liver pathology, which is where your body ends up storing the extra glucose in fat around the organs uh, because it has nowhere else to dump that sugar. So um, insulin is a fat storing hormone. And every time you drink um, a soda or you know, eat um, cake or anything you know, with sugar, um, it's telling your body to store fat. It's actually sending the message to your body 
to store fat. So it's important to keep from spiking your insulin throughout the entire day. So that's why I feel it's better to eat uh, fewer times per day uh, than to eat like six times throughout the day. It it's really always comes down to how much are you spiking your insulin throughout the day, which leads me to recommending intermittent fasting, uh, but we would need an entire other class for that. <laughs> so I will just briefly say that intermittent fasting, just to explain what it is, it's just lengthening the time in between your eating windows. So, um, so you're, well, you're eating in smaller windows of times, for example, if you chose to do eight and 16, you would eat during eight hours of the day and you would fast during 16 hours of the day. So you might choose to eat from 12 noon to 8 p.m. and fast from 8 p.m. again till 12 noon. So if you can push that breakfast time off a little later, it's a lot easier to do intermittent fasting. Eventually with intermittent fasting, people get down to like four or six hours of the day where they're eating and then they're fasting 18 or even 20 hours a day, which helps regulate your insulin and your blood sugar all throughout those whole uh, 18 or 16 or 20 hours of the day. So it, it's really, it's also of course good for weight loss because you're not spiking your insulin throughout the day. So let's apply this finally, pragmatically, to being a nomad, because that's why we're all here. We either want to be a nomad, or we are a nomad, or we're planning on being a nomad. So the way that I look at it is I would divide it into two categories. Either you have solar, and you have a refrigerator, and you have the ability to plug in a blender, or you do not have solar, and you know, you're maybe in a smaller car or you can't afford solar yet. So let's look at those two different nomad lifestyles and how we can um, you know, benefit from eating healthy and how we can do it in the best way possible. So I have 150 watts of solar, just so you know how low you can go and run a fridge. And I run a 12 volt fridge, it's a 50 quart fridge. And I make it work, uh, you know, in a, a real small car. So even with 150 watts of solar, you can have a 12 volt refrigerator and a pretty big one even. Um, you know, I'll, I'll show it to you if we have time. Okay, so let's talk about, first I want to talk about if you have solar and you have a fridge. So definitely having a fridge is the easiest way to eat healthy on the road. And I feel it's important for the following reasons. One, it allows you to visit farmer's markets throughout the summer, which is like the freshest food you can possibly get. And it allows you to go to somewhere like a Whole Foods Market or a Sprouts or Trader Joe's, and you can buy enough food for seven to 10 days, and you'll, it, you'll be able to store that food while you're boondocking without having down. And that's going to be the freshest food you can get by having a fridge. And it's going to keep those enzymes alive in that food by it being refrigerated. Um, so I do fit 10 days of food in my 50 quart fridge. And um, you would never imagine that I would get like two huge grocery packs in my little fridge. But the way that you do it, and I think it's really key, and I spoke about this with Sue Ann, and she wanted to mention it to you also, is that I don't even leave the grocery store parking lot without putting every ounce of food, taking it out of the packaging, and I repack it into Ziploc bags that then go in my fridge. So I buy a lot of like pre-made salads. I put those into um, a quart, uh, I think that's a quart bag, the bigger ones, and I roll them up and stack them all in my fridge and I can fit like 10 salads in there. So um, really important to take your food out of the packaging and all of my food I take out of the packaging except for like juices. So um, the next thing I wanna talk about is if you have solar, you can run a blender. And by that, I don't mean like an expensive Vitamix, and I don't mean an expensive juicer. I mean bottom of the line, Walmart, $14 blender. And that is how I've done it for 20 years. <laughs> 
many years, I've had a bottom of the line Walmart blender and they're awesome for making healthy blended smoothies every day with for very little money. And you don't need a Vitamix, you don't need expensive juicer or anything like that. Um, for a blender, you can make, uh, with a blender, you can make green smoothies. You can use avocado or banana as your base. You can add spinach, like baby spinach that comes in those little tubs. You can put in some coconut water, maybe some mango or a little bit of fruit and add that to your greens like spinach or baby lettuce to create delicious meals in your blender. They're alkaline and they're full of enzymes and they're full of oxygen, the top three things that um, I believe are important. And just a little tip, if you squeeze lemon juice into your blended smoothies, it really cuts the taste of the greens. So it's, it's a really good idea to do that. Um, and then uh, I just wanna say to the, um, to the admin, uh, Phyllis and Alicia, I, uh, I spoke with Sue Ann about going to 35 or 40 minutes. So I'm watching the time, but um, I'll probably go to 35 minutes here. So, um, so by the way, um, so we're talking about a blender and it really starts out your day alkaline and you're able to replenish your body. And in the morning, your body's still cleansing. So your liver and your kidneys are still cleansing. So by drinking an alkaline drink, you're able to like still continue the cleansing process. Just to know on voltage and inverters, uh, with that $14 Walmart blender, usually it's 200 watts. You need a 400 watt inverter at least. So anytime you're looking at the bottom of your um, piece of equipment, whether it's a blender or juicer, or whatever it is, take what the watts are and it'll say on the bottom on the label and double that. And that's what you need your inverter to be at least because the startup process, it's going to pull more. So, um, so I had in my van for two and a half years, I had a 600 watt inverter and no problem. I ran a 200 watt blender, no problem. So um, also you can purchase already cooked cruciferous vegetables such as Brussels sprouts, broccoli, bok choy, cabbage, cauliflower. You can find all those pre-cooked at Whole Foods and they're in the refrigerated section in the deli. Um, I recommend at least a 50 quart refrigerator um, because I would not go any smaller than 50 quarts, especially for farmers markets, because you tend to buy a lot of bulky leaf, you know, fresh lettuce and stuff, which takes up a lot of room in the fridge. So, um, so those are my tips for if you have solar and a fridge. And now I, I bet a lot of you don't have solar and don't have a fridge. So I really want to address that. I mean, at the least it means more trips to the store, and at the most it means more canned or processed foods, less food with living enzymes, because you'll end up buying foods that store well, so they're more likely to be canned or packaged, and they'll be a little more acidic unless they're like green vegetables. But I think that if that is your only option for now, you know, let's talk about what you can do. You can buy a super insulated, sort of a higher end cooler, like a Arctic, it's just the word R-T-I-C, or a Yeti. And those are like the super insulated, sort of high end coolers. Now in it for ice, you can get those dry bags that you would use on a rafting trip or a canoe trip. And you can get a block of ice and you could slip the ice into the dry bag and then roll that up, snap it shut. Now that won't be like totally leak proof, but you could actually put that inside of another dry bag and put that in the bottom of your cooler. And then you don't have to deal with like that slushy mess. It's, it'll last, you know, longer. And you should be able to last with that at least about five days. So in addition, if you don't have a fridge, you can still buy those pre-cooked vegetables that I talked about. If you don't wanna do a lot of cooking, you can buy those at Whole Foods. You can buy green powders and even Walmart carries green powders that you can add to your green smoothie. You know, it's not as good as fresh spinach because fresh spinach is gonna have living enzymes in it, but it's still, you know, a good option. You can buy pre-made salads, which is what I do a lot and, um, you know, keep them in your cooler for five days in a Ziploc bag. Um, you can store food in the footwell of the car on the passenger side, and that's usually the coolest area. You can use a 12 volt blender that you plug into your car lighter plug. And um, Bob has some videos on that where he reviewed a little blender. 
Um, and you can eat the more easily stored vegetables like carrots and celery that are, that are a little harder. And, you know, you can eat them with like hummus or an almond dip. And um, you can also make like open burritos with um, avocado, tomato, sprouts for a dressing because sprouts are packed with enzymes. Sprouts contain within them everything they need to grow up into an adult living plant. So sprouts are a powerhouse for enzymes. And so I just used to eat like a lot of open burritos with tons of sprouts and like a little dressing that I'd pour on it. And you can, nowadays at Whole Foods, you can even buy like coconut, tort, uh, like tortilla shells that are made from like shredded coconut or some healthier options like teff or, um, you know, uh, not as like, not just wheat, but there's usually some more options. So now um, I'd like to talk about where to shop. So let's switch gears to, you know, where can you find these healthy foods? And wow, isn't it just so expensive, Casey? How do you afford it? Well, um, I do spend a bit more money eating healthy, but I think of it as my health insurance. And you can either pay now and, you know, make this a high priority in your life, or you can pay later when you're paying the hospital for the medical bills, um, you know, for various diseases when our immune system is... Um, is uh, you know less is more susceptible to disease at a at a uh, at an age where we're growing older, so we really want to take care of ourselves now. So Walmart does have a lot of inexpensive foods, and they have a lot of organic, and they do have uh, pre-made salads in the in boxes and containers. And um, so Walmart is a good option. They have the green powders. They actually have a section where I've even seen like hemp seeds, flax oil, and all that. So that that's really good. Um, so the next option, so in terms of like, okay, Walmart would be the cheapest. And then the next one, I would say Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's will save you a ton of money. Where I would normally spend about $180, let's say, at Whole Foods, you could spend $80 at Trader Joe's and get almost all the same stuff. It will save you so much money. They, they prepackage things. They also have a lot of great options for like meats, uh, grass-fed meats, um, tuna, fish, like frozen fish and stuff like that if you happen to have a freezer. Um, okay, then one more step up. So you got Walmart, Trader Joe's, and then Sprouts. And Trader Joe's and Sprouts are in most major towns. And Sprouts is, this, um, is like the third cheapest of these options because they have a ton of produce there and they have a lot of sales and they... Um, because they move a lot of produce through, um, you can get a lot of bulk items there really cheap and also produce really cheap. So of course, the most expensive option at the very top is going to be Whole Foods. And it has the largest variety of pre-made salads, pre-cooked vegetables, and it has a juice bar. And, um, but you know, it's, it is the most expensive option. So if you can, when you come into a town, maybe you can even hit all three or you could just go to Trader Joe's and Sprouts or something. And then the fourth one is if you really don't mind spending a little more money on your health than um, juice bars. I go to a juice bar um, in every uh, major city I pass through and they are the most expensive, but they have a large variety of pre-made juices. And I have one in the fridge I could even take out if I don't mess up my internet and stuff but um but here I'll try to grab one out real quick here um okay here we go so like this one so I get really green juice I don't get any apple juice in these because um apple juice is insulinogenic again it's fruit juice it's actually going to spike your insulin so I go with like all green and these can be anywhere from five dollars to ten dollars depending on where you go and here's an example this juice has kale spinach romaine cucumber celery lemon parsley and microgreens so like when am I going to go shop and get all those things probably never so like now I can just buy it in a bottle and it's totally worth it to me um, because juice will assimilate into the blood within 15 minutes, um, whereas like a smoothie takes a little bit longer. So you're getting all these nutrients into your blood within 15 minutes, and that is fast. And that is why it's so worth it. They're full of enzymes. It's full of alkalinity. It's full of oxygen. And that's why I will go out of my way. And people who know me know that I will go anywhere to go get my juice. 
So, okay. So now let's um, talk about, you know, where to start for you pragmatically. Um, there's a few uh, books that I would like to recommend to you that are life changers. And I promise if you read all five of these books, um, your life will change forever. You'll never be the same and you'll look at food a completely different way and you'll treat your body differently. Once you have this knowledge, you can never undo it. So let me see if I can um, share my screen. Um, so if you can bear with me here one second, um, I'm going to pull up my books and there we go. Okay, so this first book here, sorry. <laughs> okay, so this first book is called um, Living Foods for Optimal Health, and it's by Dr. Uh, Brian Clement. And Dr. Brian Clement has a um, has an institute called the Hippocrates Institute. And um, it, he helps people there with living foods and um, he's amazing. It, these uh, will change your life. He gives classes on raw foods. And this book is a step-by-step -step instruction. It has um, like a hundred healthful, delicious recipes. And um, it really helps you to take control of your health and your well-being. And um, let me see if I can get the next one. Um, sorry, I'm gonna have to stop share. And um, so the next book is called Your Healthy Journey. It's by Dr. Fred Beachy. And um, I'm going to try and do a screen share if I can on it. Um, I didn't prepare as well on my screen share part. Sorry, you guys. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, Dr. Fred Beachy wrote a book called Your Healthy Journey. And I'm about to get on my screen share now. Uh, share screen. Okay, okay, here we go. So this is called Your Healthy Journey by Dr. Fred Beachy, and it's all about, he's been eating living plant foods for over 50 years, and he talks about what can uh, work for you individually. And once you understand the path about eating better, you can activate all kinds of healing capabilities. He talks about the body's biological, chemical, and physiological makeup. And um, it's a very... Um, compassionate book that helps no matter what uh, stage you're at. He has like an intermittent eating um, lifestyle, uh, which is really helpful for people. So it kind of meets you where you're at and provides like optimal eating options for you. Okay. And then the next one um, is, uh, let's see. Oh, alkalize or die. Um, let me see here. Okay, here we go. Alkalize or die. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, this book is How to Gain Superior Health Through Proper Alkaline Acid Balance. Um, it talks about uh, disease uh, and how it proliferates uh, in, in uh, tissue acid waste in the body and how to prevent sickness and disease through using foods that create alkalinity. It has um, over 350 foods with their alkaline acid values and um, it has a 21 day menu planner and 55 recipes and that is really amazing. Okay so let me see if I can do this without stopping my screen share. Oh I think I can. Okay the China study. Oh my gosh. Uh, I don't think uh, anyone uh, has ever done a more comprehensive study of nutrition and, and the startling implications for your diet, weight loss, and longevity. Uh, the findings of the, the China study, uh, it's an incredibly important book. It demonstrates the link between nutrition and heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Uh, this book uh, you know, really proves to readers by changing their diet, you can dramatically reduce your chance of developing these diseases. And um, let me see here, I've got another book. Um, fresh fruit and vegetable juices. Uh, let me see if I can bring this up. Okay, well, this is Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Juices by Dr. Norman Walker. And Dr. Norman Walker is really kind of like the father of juicing. 
Um, and I know that looks a little small there. Sorry about that. Um, he really pioneered the field of vegetable juicing and nutritional health. He advocated the drinking of fresh raw vegetable juices to regain and maintain your health. And, and in this book, he goes through every single uh, every single um, vegetable and um, what its benefits are. It's a very in-depth look at juicing. So the books that we went over, uh, just to reiterate, Living Foods for Optimal Health by Dr. Brian Clement. Uh, Dr. Fred Beachy wrote Your Healthy Journey, Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Juices by Dr. Norman Walker, Alkalize or Die uh, by, I think his name is Barodi or Baruti and the China study. Okay, so I'm gonna stop screen share there. And so really um, coming into conclusion, um, there are just a couple things that um, I wanted to say to help to motivate you. I really appreciate that you came here today because it says to yourself that like you're worth it, you, you are really wanting to do something for yourself. And if you wanna enjoy different results, you really have to take different actions. The hardest part in all of this is it really isn't what you'd imagine. The hardest part about this is deciding with all of your heart that you are going to commit to making this change. And once you do that, the rest really becomes easy. You don't have to change for the rest of your life, but just try it for a week or two and observe how you feel. Our genetics are the gun, and this is what I learned throughout the last 20 years. If I learned anything, I learned, you know, our genetics are the gun, and that's what um, Dr. Colin Campbell talks about in the China study too, but we pull the trigger. We're the ones who pull the trigger. You can have a genetic predisposition, but it doesn't have to be uh, uh, activated throughout your lifetime. It depends on a lot of environmental factors. So develop a diet that honors your body as the physical aspect of your spirit and the temple for the spirit that keeps your mind clear and alert and elevated. And for every discipline effort, there's a multiple reward. If you want extreme transformations in your life, you have to take action. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is the real thing. Like you have this body and you have one body for the rest of your life. And if you had one car or one RV or one van for the rest of your life, what type of gas or oil would you put in that car? I mean, really, like people are dying. Um, the major diseases in America are related to the way people eat. Like I said, this is not a dress rehearsal. This is the only body you have for traveling for this lifetime. So um, making that commitment to radically improve your diet, it, it helps you to subconsciously reinforce in your mind that your life has meaning and that striving for extraordinary health is well worth the effort, um, then you're really making a commitment to really living life. So I know that's been a lot to take in in 40 minutes, but that's my brief overview of the basic principles of healthy eating, how to start and how to do it as a nomad. I hope that you found that helpful and I hope you feel inspired to find the best healthy eating plan that works for you. And I hope that you will uh, make this commitment to yourself and thank you so much for being here. Casey, the chat is now open for questions from attendees and they will be sending in your questions. Attendees, please submit your questions now. The chat is open for uh, questions on healthy eating. To send your question if you're on a computer, you have your controls at the bottom of your window, click on chat. And if you're on a mobile device, chat, tap on participants or the three dots at the top right corner of your screen, type your message in and send it. Uh, Casey will be answering your questions shortly. Thank you. Casey, if you'd like to go ahead and speak a little bit more while we check on the questions for you. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so I think um, there's probably some curiosity about my refrigerator. Um, do you want me to talk about my fridge or is that? That's fine. Anything you'd like, Casey. Okay. 
Okay. Um, so my refrigerator is an ISCO and Bob, you know, if you go on Bob's channel, he talks a lot about, he reviews a lot of different refrigerators. So I've always been a winter refrigerator person and winter it's, I think it's W H Y N T E R and winter has a huge, um, around the edges, it has like a two inch seal. It's like, it's really amazing. So my winter is still going. I sold my van, but my winter has been going for like two and a half years and never had a problem with it at all. But right now I have an ISCO and it has a Dan Foss compressor. And if you watch Bob's um, videos, he talks about a Don, Dan Foss compressor. There's only a couple companies that have them. That's ISCO, um, Intel, and um, the expensive one, I forget the name of that. Okay, Casey, you do have questions here. The first one come to us from Lisa, and she said, thank you for this motivating talk. I hope to be able to use my sprouting gear on the road too, regarding juicing, because it requires so many veggies for just one drink. Does the natural sugar content make it better to just eat them over time? Also, does adding lemon juice on, undo the alkaline pros of making a green drink? Thanks. Excellent question. Really good question. Um, yeah, so I've always learned, like, from the people where, that I learned from at the health institutes I worked at, to not drink any kind of fruit juice in my um, vegetable juice, because that sugar content, it is enough to spike your insulin level and, um, and bring that alkalinity down. So really, I'm going for the juice for very high alkalinity content, which means no fruit juice. Um, the other part of that question regarding lemon juice, it's really interesting. There are very few fruits that are alkaline, but the effect of lemon juice in the body is actually alkalizing. So when you use lemon juice, it's quite alkalizing. In fact, one of the things I was going to mention in my talk is to alkalize the body instantly or very quickly. You can drink um, sodium bicarbonate, a little bit of... Um, of uh, of sodium bicarbonate, uh, like a little teaspoon or half a teaspoon in water, or you can drink a glass of lemon juice. Does that address the question? Wonderful, Casey, thank you. And Veronica asks, can healthy eating reverse things like hypothyroid? Great question. It, I, have, I have known people who have reverse hyperthyroid uh, because it's usually an iodine issue and it has to do with a T3 or T4 um, uh, I know it's like, I, I'm not sure if it's like T3, T4 cells or, but I know that's like the name and you need to reverse that by getting a lot of iodine in. So at the health I worked at, we used to have iodine drops and I would highly recommend if you don't mind the taste, um, uh, taking out, uh, iodine drops either on your food or putting them in your smoothie where you really wouldn't taste them. And you can get, um, you know, like food grade iodine drops. I, I don't know right now where, because I haven't gone to look for them, but they do exist. Julian says, wow, thanks. Exactly what I needed. Can you tell me the brand of refrigerator you use, Casey? Yeah, so as we were talking about fridges, I use Isco and I will, I'll take my, um, I can show you guys, or I can take my camera for here for a second. And um, so here's my fridge right here. It's an ice code. This is a 50 quart, so you can kind of see about how big it is. It's a little bit bigger than the length of my forearm. I don't, I recommend at least going 50 quart. This has two sections, a section here that I drop my juices into and then a bigger section. Um, like I said, I really like winter fridges a lot. Um, but I'm loving this ice co. It's super quiet. And as long as you get something with a Dan Foss compressor, although I don't think winter has a Dan Foss compressor, but they're super, super quiet. So that's Intel ice co. And what is the name? Do you guys remember the name of the really expensive, um, refrigerators that most people buy? I forget, but anyway, the 12 volt, it's a 12 volt, it's super expensive. And they all, they also have a Dan Foss. Okay. Ilana says, once you juice, is there a time frame to consume while enzymes are fresh? Yeah, excellent question. Yes, within 15 minutes. And even though that is optimal, because we're nomads and we're on the road and you're like, you're not always at the juice place. <laughs> so I just do the best I can. But surprisingly, 
these juices do not go bad. They taste actually super fresh. I've gone out as far as like eight or even 10 days, but it really depends on the juicing place because different juicing places that I've been to, um, I can't make the juice last as long, like if they're in plastic containers as if they're in the glass. And it depends probably how they, how much they fill them up and how they close them. So anyway, yes, 15 minutes is optimal. And that's really when you get the most for the enzymes. After 15 minutes, these enzymes will die down, but most juicing places will fill them all the way to the top and then cap them. And there's less air in there where they'll stay, the enzymes will stay alive longer. Nice. So Anne says, Dear Casey, thank you for the wonderful talk and sharing information. I am failing at growing sprouts. I have used a few different sprouters and I'm not success successfully sprouting. Do you have any pearl of wisdoms? Thank you. Yeah, really good question. I mean, I used to work at like a raw food place and we grew sprouts all the time. And yeah, it, it's like everything has to be like just perfect. Plus the thing that the key with sprouts is actually to water them multiple times per day. Um, like with sunflower sprouts, I, we had to water them a few times a day. Um, you know, I don't want to discourage you from growing sprouts on the road because I think it's great and you can totally do it, but you do need enough water to like keep them wet enough to keep them growing. And then the other thing is that I find like just going in and buying store-bought sprouts is pretty good. I look for the freshest ones I can. They usually are still um, connected to the root system and um, they stay fresh pretty long. So clover sprouts, especially baby broccoli um, sprouts are really good for you. And um, I get usually like alfalfa, clover, and broccoli, but um, they're packed, packed with nutrients. Um, great way to go. I'm sorry, I don't know more about growing them, but I, I would really um, recommend buying them. Um, it might be easier as a nomad. Brenda said, thanks, great info. And Roller Angel says, thanks for the step-by-step -step guidebooks. Do you use only a refrigerator, no freezer? That's correct. I use only a refrigerator. Enzymes actually die when they're frozen or when they're heated. So either when they're heated to 120 degrees or when they're frozen. So I don't freeze anything and I don't eat any frozen food. Um, my refrigerator, oh, I will say, I actually don't go as low as a lot of people go. I This one is at, I'm at 34 on this one, but I kept it even higher on my winter at like 38. And I just found that you know, that was about the perfect temperature for me for salads and juices, kept everything fresh. So somewhere between 34 and 38, I feel is kind of optimal. Wonderful. So uh, Heather said, very interesting, especially about alcohol. And Christine says, what was the wattage of solar and fridge blender to, the compa to be compatible? Um, okay, so my fridge, Ah, oh boy, Bob would know more about this. I don't know exactly what my fridge is pulling, but I know it's it's running off 150 watts. As far as the blender and the inverter, that's a like like whatever you, whatever you buy, whether it's a blender or a juicer or whatever you choose, look on the bottom label, and then you want to double that. So you have to double it for your startup off the inverter. So if it's a 200 watt blender, you want to have at least a 400 watt inverter. I lived for two and a half years just fine with a 600 watt inverter for whatever I needed. So that was enough. I would say go as high as you can though with your solar system because then no matter what, if you want to use like a centrifugal force juicer or anything, you'll have enough um, on a higher uh, higher inverter. Okay, I'm not Tim a solar says, expert. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. Tim says, I have been plant-based whole foods for eight months now. I would love any pointers and advice, specifically a tour on your fridge and how you store your veg. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Good for you. Um, yeah. Like I said, like I, um, well, let's see if we were to look in here. Let me, <laughs> let me see what it looks like first. Um, I didn't have time to really, well, I don't think I have enough lighting unless I turn my lighting up here. I'll, tr I'll try to turn the lighting up for a sec. If you can bear with me. So, okay. So here's my ISCO fridge. Not optimal. It opens like this. It would be better if it opened that way. And then, okay, there's all my salads in my Ziplocs. There's my juice. And then those are salad dressings that came 
I go, I get um, prepackaged salads from Whole Foods and sometimes they come with uh, vegan dressings. So I've got some dressings in there. And then in this back section here, that's my dog food um, for my dog. So I kind of separate that or just put my glass juices. So my fridge looks like a mess, but basically what you want to do, like I said, I can't even um, reiterate the importance of just remove all of your packaging before you get to your car. Like it doesn't even get into my car <laughs> before I repackage it. Um, as far as other pointers, oh, go ahead. I'm not sure about as far as other pointers. <laughs> Sorry, I'm listening. Okay, Casey, great information. And I am just starting for fatty lip. I am just starting for fatty liver disease. So need a alkaline diet. Is that book good to start with alkaline or dye? Yes, alkalize or dye, excellent. And just know that fatty liver pathology is reversible. It takes some time, but you can reverse it, but it, it will take some time. But the first place that your body will lose fat is actually from around the organs. So have a lot of hope for that. Yes, alkalize or dye would be phenomenal. You really, really want to bring that sugar content down and you don't want to drink fruit juice. Okay, Deidre said, just want to say thank you for your information today. It was very helpful. Alma followed by, thank you, Casey. Your presentation was fabulous and I do feel very inspired. And Karen says, can you talk about how to wash all veggies like radishes with limited access to water? That's a great question. I would use a strainer, maybe with like another bowl underneath it and just um, carry enough water to kind of rinse them out in a strainer. And then you can kind of shake that out and put it into your Ziploc bags. Um, all the um, pre-made salads that I buy are pre-washed. Um, it's like a smaller company that I get it from. But, um, but anyway, um, yeah, so I would say I would say to do that, um, just uh, get as fresh a water as you can. Hopefully, not with not chlorinated water, if possible. Maybe buy like some spring water or even distilled water. If you can't get spring water, distilled water is like the next best thing. Awesome. What about buying frozen vegetables and storing them thawed in the fridge? Do you eat any fruit? What do you eat for protein? And that's from Amen. Okay, I'll, I'll um, so that I don't get into like a long explanation of protein, I'll keep it like real short. But basically, personally, what I believe is that living plant foods contain 50% protein. Um, the cow is getting it from the grass, so I, I get it firsthand from my uh, leafy greens. I also don't believe we need an extraordinary amount of protein because mother's milk is 2% protein and an infant would never need more than 2% for the most growth you're ever doing in your life. So therefore, I don't believe I need an excessive amount of protein. And, and Dr. Colin Campbell talks about that in the China study. Um, what was the first part of that question? What about buying frozen vegetables and storing them thawed in the fridge? And do gotcha. Okay. Okay. So as far as buying frozen vegetables, I don't. Uh, because, uh, as I said, enzymes also die from freezing. So I, for me personally, I don't believe that frozen vegetables are like the freshest source that I can get for enzymes and stuff. But it's not bad. If you, if you have a freezer and that's one of your options, that's great. I mean, I mean, greens, at least they have a lot of folate, vitamin K, A and C. You're getting lots of minerals. So that's still really a good option. Um, for me, I, I will go out of my way, no matter how far I have to go to have um, fresh, fresh food. And John says, absolutely wonderful. Thank you. How long will that salad last you? Excellent question again. So usually I'll buy 10 pre-made salads, like organic salads from Whole Foods. Um, they will last me, well, it kind of depends. Like if I vary the temperature on my fridge, if it like gets too high accidentally or something, it won't last as long. But I've had salads last as long as like about six or seven days 
um, kind of max. And then from seven to 10, usually that's where I'll go do my like, when I was talking about 90, 10, like I'll stay 95% raw most of the time. And then and then like 5% of the time, I'll let myself go eat Chinese food or something like that, you know? So that's where I do my meal is my day before I know that I'm driving to like Whole Foods. That's where I do like my cheat meal or whatever. Okay. John says, that was John. Lisa Stewart says, thank you so much. I have already started this intermittent fasting without knowing, uh, without knowing it. You have just let me know I'm doing it right. Then Lynn yeah. says, Casey, many nomads are in small rural towns with tiny grocers that often have limited vegetables. How can a person cope and still find food with some nutrition? Okay, awesome. So first of all, I want to say to Lisa, way to go on the intermittent fasting. That is the best way to regulate your blood sugar. And I think that's just great. And you are doing it right. Um, to Lynn, um, so true. So check this out, Lynn. When I went raw, 100% raw, I lived in Alaska in Talkeetna, which is two and a half hours from Anchorage. And I drove two and a half hours to get all my vegetables and fruit and drove two and a half hours back to Talkeetna. So I had a five hour round trip. So um, if you have limited vegetables, you know, and I've dealt with that a lot because I've lived rurally like a lot over the last 20 years. Um, what you can do is like, let's say there's pretty much always a Walmart anywhere you go or there's, you know, yeah, like a small grocer. I just go to the produce section and that's where I... I don't even really shop much in the rest of the store. You know, I'll just go through, well, well, do they have jicama? Jicama will, you know, you can cut it into slices and it's like a cross between like a potato and an apple, but it, it's like crunchy and full of water and nutrients. So anyway, that's a root vegetable you can get that's really hearty at a lot of places. Um, you know, I'll just do the best I can, like celery, almost every place would have celery and almost every place would have hummus or carrots or you know just just try to think alkaline so just try to think okay i'll just get some broccoli even though i'm cooking the broccoli and the asparagus at least i'm you know getting those phytonutrients from the green vegetables so try just to think green as much as possible and try to like kind of stay off like the heavy carb stuff okay casey we have two more minutes for taking questions and bobby asks what about dehydrated foods yeah, dehydrated foods are great. You can dehydrate up to like, I think 108 degrees and still maintain enzymes in the food. So dehydrated foods are great. And, um, you know, if you, you could probably run a dehydrator, although a dehydrator, you have to run for hours and hours. I'm talking like all night, like eight hours, 10 hours to dehydrate your food. So that's going to pull a ton of solar unless you're living in sticks and bricks and then it would be a lot easier. Okay, I think you may have gotten this question before. Can healthy eating reverse things like hyperthyroid? Yeah, we did. We talked about that. We addressed that. Okay, wonderful. You have so many thank yous. And so I'm looking for an actual question for you, Casey. So many thank yous going here. Okay, how many times a day can I supplement with smoothies? Um, you know, smoothies, you could have two, I used to eat two smoothies a day, first thing in the morning to alkalize and help, um, you know, maintain the cleansing um, of my body from the morning. And, um, and I'd have a big smoothie at night. Smoothies do not have to be sweet. They can be savory. And in fact, most of the smoothies that I make are savory. To do that, start with the base of avocado, add tomatoes. You can add like a little bit of orange juice, but not, not too much. And then you can add your greens. And uh, what else? I used to put in Himalayan sea salt, lemon juice, cilantro, like just kind of get creative or look online for raw food for savory smoothie recipes, because those are called raw soups, basically. And they are delicious. You can add like miso and make your whole dinner from a smoothie. And it's, it's awesome and very assimil assimilable into your bloodstream. One last question uh, for the morning, Casey. Is there substitutes for carciferous veggies? I cannot eat those because my pounds condition. 
Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I'd say green, use uh, green powders. You know, you can get um, like superfood green powders at like any, pretty much any store, even Walmart. And um, you know, it helps keep you alkaline at least. Um, so that's great. Uh, maybe cauliflower or it sounds like you don't, you can't eat cauliflower, but um, you know, just then I'd go with like, um, well, I'm not sure if salads, if you're not able to eat salads or not, but, or juices or drink juices, that's a great way to, to get those vegetables in or smoothies because spinach is the least harsh, like green taste of all the greens. So I'd say try mixing some spinach and a delicious treat would be spinach and mango blended together. And uh, that tastes delicious and you don't even taste the greens. Thank you, Casey, for an enlightening presentation about eating healthy on the road. Thank you all so very much for being here and for your attendance to Howe's virtual caravan class. Casey will be here for an additional 15 minutes in the chat to answer uh, any other additional questions. Please have a safe weekend. Casey, do you have any parting words? Uh, just, you can do it. And you know, like this is so my passion to like see you guys here and, and know that your lives are changing and it's so exciting. And, and I really hope that you get those books. They're just life changers and you know, best of luck to you and and thank you so much for attending today